So it's my pleasure to come and speak on this topic about how software skills and data science intersect. A lot of what I'm going to share comes from experience, seven to eight years of experience failing at doing stuff and failing badly as well. And so if I do, there, there are certain points that I will make inside the talk that may come across as exceptionally passionate about that point. And the reason is because I have had personal failures uh, on that pertain to that point. For example, one, one of them being the most personal being uh, pertaining to software environments and not dealing with software environments properly. And as a result, through a series and chain of events, breaking iPhoto on my MacBook and then freaking out that <laughs> I can't access my MacBook, uh, my, my photos on, 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 my, on my computer. All right. So as a result, uh, there, I just want everyone to be quite aware of that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to follow along with the slides on your own system or reference the slide deck later on, I've put the link to this slide uh, inside uh, the WebEx chat. And you can also, uh, uh, if you want to record this uh, somewhere, you can like copy and paste it somewhere. Cool. So just a little bit about myself. I am at Moderna. It is that Moderna. Uh, the running joke is that I didn't join early enough to profit from the pandemic, so I'm here for the science, All right? So I actually am in in it for because I believe that the that Moderna is poised to make science run at the speed of thought, and that has been something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Moderna has uh, the necessary com computational infrastructure to make that happen, and it also has, I I guess you could say, a fresh start. You know, a fresh enough culture. It's not a doesn't have a long legacy of how things ought to be done. So um, being a new organization means there's no legacy to really back fall back onto, meaning we, we have a chance to make that happen. Uh, I have I am part of the DSAI team. I have teammates who work with me on the research side of Moderna. DSAI does have other support functions. So we do support, for example, commercial, clinical, pharmacovigilance, et cetera. Uh, I'm a science nerd and really want to focus on the science. So I do mostly re uh, primarily and almost exclusively research related projects. And by research, what we mean is figuring out how to build machine learning powered systems that let us explore sequence space or chemical space more efficiently while also uh, executing on projects that uh, help automate analyses uh, in a standardized fashion so that our, our bench scientists don't get stuck wrangling Excel files left and right or clicking on GUIs to make something, you know, to do their analysis. Um, especially if we're, because Moderna does so much screening work, being able to do this stuff in, a, in an automated fashion is really uh, important. Some of the tooling that we use involve basically um, a lot of software development, there is all, uh, a strong uh, machine learning component to what we do, whether it's traditional, so-called traditional machine learning or uh, more advanced neural net based machine learning. We do both of them. Uh, we also do pro a lot of probabilistic modeling and we use probabilistic models in our work as well. Uh, probabilistic models are important because they let us, and Bayesian models more generally, allow us to really properly quantify noise, which tells us what the limit of our machine learning models could be. So, and then a little bit, bit more rarely, sometimes we do use network science. That is something that I picked up in my grad school during uh, grad school days. Um, and that's something that is just part of our toolkit as well. I did my degree in the Department of Biological Engineering at MIT. It's uh, uh, quite the story how I got in. I got in through the back door and walked out through the front door and I chose the SCD title because I want a yellow hood, not the blue hood, instead of which the PhDs get. So uh, I, I don't tend to treat this degree particularly seriously, although I recognize that it has uh, given me a lot and a lot and a lot of valuable training opportunities. And if the, for those of you who want to talk about, you know, PhD after after this, I'm happy to talk about it, just knowing that, of course, not every it's not for everyone. Uh, there are trade-offs that you will make doing a PhD or a doctorate training. Uh, there are things you gain and things you lose 
uh, as a result. So you just need to make a really informed decision. Okay, so as a data scientist, there are lessons I've picked up from my work. The two big ones that I think are worth sharing today are that we collaborate. Uh, and the second one is, is that our stuff needs to be portable. On that first point, a lot of PhD work is individual. So we don't end up working with other people. And if projects are structured, sorry, and if, if you're in a master's of data science program, but your projects are structured as individual work, then you also don't end up collaborating very much. If they're structured as group work, those of you who know the struggles of working in a group will understand that you need some uh, practices, you need some tooling, shared tooling, uh, and you need ways of working and idioms that really enable you to work together. And that's part of what I'm going to be sharing. The second thing is that uh, our stuff really needs to be portable, right? And on that second point, it's because it no longer is the case that your data science work can just work on your laptop. Your data science work has to work on someone else's laptop. It has to work in the cloud. It has to work on an HPC machine, right? Um, and if that is not true of your work, then you're going to face a gazillion barriers to shipping your work to be impactful, right? There, the, a, a very underappreciated point about data science work is that it has a very complex stack and a lot of work has been a lot of hard work by many people has gone into making that stack shippable and easy for easy for us to ship. And then we, what we have to do is take advantage of that uh, technology stack, packaging systems, Docker containers, Conda environments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I put this quote below from it's a it's a it's my own phrasing of an idea that has come to, to me very clearly in recent years. Data science is no longer solo work, it is teamwork. At Moderna's DSAI team, we explicitly operate as a team. Every project has a lead and a backup. And for me, because I'm the most so-called senior person doing research, I am the ultimate backup for every project uh, in the research space. Now, the corollary of data science being teamwork means that if you have better discipline, you will collaborate better. And I'm gonna elaborate on this in my talk today. So these are those two key lessons imply something about how we need to work, right? And how we need to work really enables the, the, us to fulfill, uh, or rather how structuring how we work in a disciplined fashion, it really enables us to collaborate well together. So when we think about collaboration, the first thing we should think about is that it implies sharing of stuff. At Moderna, we're structured as a team where every project has a lead and a backup with me as the ultimate backup. What that implies is that every teammate must be able to jump onto any project in an easy fashion. They should not have a high cognitive barrier to jumping onto a project. They, when they look at a project repository, a Git repository, they should be able to look at it and go, yes, notebooks are there. Source code is here. Things that handle data are there. Things that write to disk are there. Things that uh, create a command line interface for the project are here. So what that enables is that we have no cognitive load jumping onto someone else's project with respect to the structure of the project. In addition to that, we work with tools that enable us, uh, we work and standardize on tools and workflows that enable us to work together. A uh, few examples that I will talk about later, we use Visual Studio Code almost exclusively uh, for our development work, and that's because it allows us to co-write source code together. In addition to that, <clears throat> the Jupyter Notebook interface uh, is also well supported as well, so we never have to context switch between our source code and a JupyterLab interface, for example. And we have other integrations with internal systems, Jira and Bitbucket, for example, or GitHub if you're on the GitHub ecosystem. Both of those uh, uh, extensions exist for VS Code and allow us to really never have to context switch out of our projects. We also standardize on the way that we develop our projects. At Moderna, 
uh, depends on your interest, but in my case, thankfully, we don't have to build graphical user interfaces. We only have to build command line tools that spit out files uh, for our car colleagues. And those get packaged up and deployed on in Docker containers in a highly scalable compute system that we have. Um, I won't talk about that compute system today, but we can you know, offline talk about that if you're curious about it. Because we've standardized on that, there's zero ambiguity about what our endpoint is. Our deliverables are always going to be Python packages or compute tasks and nothing else. Uh, and as a result, with the clear expectations, we collaborate with teams, other teams in Moderna in a very, very efficient fashion because they know we stop where we stop and where we need to engage a software development, professional software development team for other things. The final thing is that um, when we talk about collaborative work together, usually you have to share notebooks, source code, and data. And I don't know if you've had this conversation ever before, but A goes, oh, I put that, I put that Excel file in OneDrive, and then it's named with an underscore 20220404, right? Um, that never happens for us at Moderna, or at least within the DSAI team. We have a data version control system that we are able to use to reference data by specific commit hashes, and with that comes zero ambiguity when talking about data and code. Our artifacts are also shipped with, with versioning as well. So if someone finds out that they are using an older version of a thing, we can tell them, please upgrade to the latest thing, then your problems will be fixed. So as a result, we really buy into this idea of zero ambiguity through versioning. And <clears throat> in doing so, we really eliminate many, many, many sources of problems. All right, so how, how do we enable all of this stuff? I'm gonna start off with project structure templates. This is extremely important. For those of you who have heard about the cookie, cookie cutter data science stack, this is one essential uh, it, is, uh, it is something that we have modeled and used inside internally uh, in, in our project, project stacks. Um, all of our projects are I initialized identically. They are initialized and look exactly like Python packages with only one exception. They have an additional directory called notebooks, which allow us to store prototypes, notebooks, explorations and stuff, right? Any customization happens afterwards. Uh, so if, if, for example, a project ends up not needing the notebooks directory, then <clears throat> that notebooks directory is removed. If, for example, a, data, uh, a, a project ends up needing a, an artifacts directory for whatever reason, it, we never need it at Moderna because we have an artifacts repository as well. Um, but if you ever needed it, we can add it in. And what's important is that there is a command line tool that we use internally that helps us initialize projects completely identically. So it makes the good things easy to do. You never have to remember how projects are supposed to be structured. You will get your project initialized in a templated fashion, and then you can remove all the things that you don't need one by one. It even comes with all of the configuration files that are necessary for all of the tooling to work. And if you ever find that you need additional things to be incorporated into that template, we actually store our project templates is, as part of a Git repository, which means if you want to make an additional customization, all you have to do is go and make a pull request to that Git repository and you're done. And then now everyone can benefit from the common customizations that you've just contributed. So that's a really important, this, this use of standardized project structure templates is one thing that's really important. I mentioned just now that by standardizing the locations of different things, notebooks go here, software goes there, tests go here, documentation goes there. No one has to wrap their head around someone else's idiosyncratic way of working. We all just buy in into this one way of figuring, uh, one fairly sane way of working that is incrementally upgradable as new uh, practices become common. On my front, what I have done to try to make that tooling uh, a little bit more accessible outside of the, uh, in, in the open source world is to create a mimic of the internal tooling in my own time. 
And so <clears throat> this is what we call uh, PyDS CLI, and it's essentially a command line interface. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's essentially a command line tool that helps with the initial project, uh, standardized project cre uh, repository creation. It also manages, uh, automatically sets up your Conda environment for you. It automatically sets up git commit hooks for you and all of that good stuff. So really the, the, the whole mantra behind building command line tools that make these, make this initialization of projects easy is to make the right thing easy to do. And then of course I mentioned git commit hooks, which make the hard, the wrong thing hard to do. You cannot commit code that does not have documentation. Um, doc strings, for example, and if your doc strings are not populated, my, your our standard git commit hooks will also complain and not let you commit your code until you've fixed all of those problems. If you have code formatting problems, we listen to the bot. We never argue amongst humans what code formatting should look like. You just get black to format your code. Um, if there are issues that uh, code linters have found, we listen to the linters. Just listen to the bot. Don't argue amongst humans about these nitty gritty details. So we have lots of automated checks for code quality as well that go into our projects. And what this has done is made it really easy for other people to come into the other teammates to come into a project and go, yeah, okay, it looks idiomatic. I'm not tripped up by any little syntactic weirdness that I see inside someone else's code. So this is a really, this is my little contribution back to the open source world about like trying to encourage things. It's highly experimental. As you can see, the version number is still in the 0, 0. point something. I offer this as a, uh, an exploration in, or, you know, practical research into how can we make this, uh, standardized project thing plus management of environments, uh, really easy. So apart from tooling, we also, one other way of making it very easy for other people to come up on board onto a project is to define sources of truth. That is everything has a defined source of truth. Your code, if we talk about code, we're always pointing to a particular commit that lives on Bitbucket or GitHub. If we're talking about entire code libraries that our colleagues depend on, then always they have to tell us which version they're using. As I mentioned earlier, we have a versioning system that's internal at Moderna that allows us to uh, version our data separately from our source code. And it has Git-like hashes that allow us to always reference that specific data hash whenever we're talking about data. With that level of specificity comes zero ambiguity. And when it comes, and that zero ambiguity percolates into our code, right? Uh, I'm showing up here a caricature of the kind of code we end up writing. We have a custom source code package that supports all of our uh, Jupyter Notebook exploration work as well as serve double up as a software library that other people can use. And there's zero ambiguity whenever we load a data. There's always a commit hash that we have to reference. We never look, we never allow ourselves to reference uh, the latest commit, for example. Um, and what this does is, is it guarantees 100% reproducibility at the step that we re uh, reference a particular commit hash. Guaranteeing full reproducibility across the entire project is hard, but what we can do is in little chunks across the project, ensure that bits and pieces are reproducible. So, as I mentioned, we have this custom source code package. And so for those of you who are looking at it and going like, what, I have to write software now? If you've ever had this conversation that I'm showing on the screen, you will know why we have to have, uh, we have, to have the skills to write good software. Because if someone comes in and you're going like, uh, you're asking that person, wait, hold on, we were talking about a function. Was it in notebook 12? And then they go, no, I actually copied notebook 12, cloned it and made it notebook 13, and then modified the function. And now both of you are left wondering, whose do we trust? Which is the right source of truth for that function that is supposed to do that one defined thing, right? Uh, by, ident by refactoring your code into the custom source library and re-importing it, as I'm showing over here, 
right? Uh, what you are end up what you end up doing is defining a single source of truth for the source code that is supposed to do a particular thing, and by doing that, you can now re-import that code back into your notebooks, back into someone else's uh, thing, and in doing so, what you end up is uh, what you end up with is a ver is is clarity when you're talking with your colleague and you're referring to pieces of code that need to be changed, etc. By structuring your code in this refactored fashion, you really gain a lot when it comes to collaborating. You can now talk very clearly about that particular function that does that particular thing. In addition to that, sometimes you may need to modify that function. As I mentioned in that one example, someone took the function in Notebook 12 cloned it into Notebook 13 and modified it. So how are we supposed to know that the modifications didn't break the intended use case of that function in Notebook 12? Well, the way we do that is by writing tests, tests that live independent of, uh, tests that are nicely isolated and live independent of the source code, uh, well, not independent of the source code, but uh, sort of, not, not embedded inside the source code, but like separate from the source code, still in the same project repository. If you're familiar with software testing, you end up using PyTest to test your code. At Moderna, we do test our code. It, there's a recognition that not every function is easily tested with a unit test. So we test what we can and we leave what we can't to a later date. And so that's sort of a pragmatic compromise. But what I, what I do, when we do the code review with each other, right? Someone comes in and makes a modification to the function. We'll ask the question: um, Did did that break the other? Did that break the existing test, or did that break the intended use of the particular function? By writing a test, you put in a contract form uh, what the intended use of the function is supposed to look like. As it turns out, tests in software engineering practice are also a really good source of documentation because they show exactly how we are supposed to build up to the use of that function and then uh, and before calling up calling on that function all right so if you if you do this uh, uh, practice if you engage in the practice of testing then what what you gain is confidence that any changes that you make to the source code still will work for existing intended use cases and therefore preserve the reproducibility of older work. When you, for those of us, uh, I think all of us who are in the Python plus data science land will use pandas. And for those of you who have received pandas data frames, either as CSV files, parquet files, or whatever, that have corrupted data, data that don't fulfill our expectations, you'll know how much of a pain it is to debug what's going on inside there. So thankfully, in recent years, there's been tooling that allow us to do data validation checks, and tools like Pandera allow us to do that. Um, Pandera gives us the capability of writing a data frame schema which declares that this particular column should be an integer, that particular column should be a floating point, this third column should be a string that follows a particular regex, a fourth column should be a floating point that is positive only, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can do with Pandera is then use it to check the inputs and outputs of your data handling functions. If things handle pandas, if functions handle pandas data frames, you can check the inputs and the outputs of uh, those pandas uh, of data frame arguments that are passed in and the return of that function respectively. And in doing so, you reduce the amount of time that you need to go and debug your data, right? If something wrong happened, uh, if, if you think about what could counterfactually happen, if you didn't check your data at data loading and you just start, started writing code against that data frame and it had something that violated your assumptions about what that data frame should be looking like, you could end up with an, an entire half a day of debugging 
what, what exactly was it in the data frame that went wrong? Whereas on the other hand, if you use Pandera, then your data frames are validated right at the point of execution of this function. Um, and in doing so, you, you can immediately catch errors in the data frame before they show up, uh, before they break your, your downstream code. All right, so those are some project specific um, practices that enable us to uh, work in a fashion that is reliable, reproducible, and collaborative. Let's, let's take it further. I mentioned earlier on that our work has to be portable. It's no longer the case that you can do your analysis on your dev machine, like your little laptop, and then uh, uh, expect yourself, expect to be able to throw that notebook to someone else uh, as, you know, sent by email uh, and have them run the, the same the same notebook uh, on another laptop. Back in 2014, when I first started out using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, that even that was not uh, something that is a reasonable expectation, and it is not a reasonable expectation in 2022 either. So if you know that the code works on your system, it is, and you wish for your work to have a tangible impact on the processes of your colleagues, right? then you need to know how to ship that work in a fashion that does not depend on the idiosyncrasies of your little laptop. So let's, let's think about how, what the key problem is here when we're trying to ship our work, whether it's a command line tool that calls out to a machine learning model underneath the hood, or if it's like a custom algorithm that automatically processes a stream of data, you will always have this problem that your projects are very likely to have a complex set of dependencies that are not covered by one tool. The classic example that I always go back to is that if I'm working on a chem informatics related project, I can't rely on PIP alone. I need RDKit and RDKit is only available by Conda uh, in a convenient fashion. Otherwise I have to go and like compile C++ code and, and I don't have the time for that, right? So that means part of the tool set means using Conda environments and managing my environments in a way that ensure that projects do not interfere with one another. So because most, and then I've, I've also seen another classic example where uh, an audio processing project that I had seen and helped another person debug relied on a system level Linux dependency that was not shipped by Conda. So now they had to worry about shipping the Linux system dependency in addition to the entire Conda package. So as you can see, there's a deep, your projects, even if, if, if you have been lucky enough to be uh, taken good care of by your instructors, to have well-defined Conda environments, then lucky you. But for most projects in the wild, they're, you will probably find yourself with a complex set of dependencies, CUDA for GPU work as well, that are not covered by a single tool. And so you will end up having to master a stack of tools for managing dependencies. One of those tools that's really important is container containerization technology. If you understand how to build a Docker container, and if you basically understand that Docker containers are you using a text file to explicitly define what a Linux environment should look like, then you will understand how you can use containers to ship your system onto the cloud, onto someone else's computer in an easy fashion, right? Uh, when we write our Docker containers, we write them in such a way that the entire dependency stack is explicitly defined. There's no implicitness inside here. But if we want something, say, for example, if we, if we want a particular base image, we always reference it by a particular, by a particular version number. If we include an environment.yaml file in the Docker file, it means we're signaling to the next person that we're using a Conda environment for our project. So please make sure that they know how to use Conda as well. If we have a requirements.txt, then we know we're telling the next person this is a Python, pure Python project that does not depend on like C binaries and et cetera, extensions. So uh, containers essentially let you ship your computer. I believe there's a, there's a really cool image, uh, meme, sorry, 
of how Docker was born, where you have like this adult and a kid on a bench. The kid is crying. The kid is like the junior developer going like, but it worked on my computer, right? And then the adult goes, well, okay, we'll, we'll ship your computer, right? And then that's how Docker was born, right? That's basically Docker is ship your computer. Um, but now, now the thing though, is that you have to be able to understand Docker syntax, which is admittedly more complexity, but the, where it becomes worth it is suddenly this will work on someone else's computer. Your container will run on another, uh, on a cloud instance as well. When it comes to how we do our development work, one thing that I did not appreciate before during my time in grad school and my time in Novartis was that uh, our development environment really needs to be portable. Because if we develop our project on our little laptop and it's got all sorts of idiosyncratic uh, conveniences that make our lives easy but make life confusing for someone else that we're working with, or it's got an implicit set of dependencies that we've installed that may not necessarily exist on another computer, then uh, we, end up, we end up in this really tricky situation where it's tough to collaborate, right? And tough to share our work with others. So one of the things that I've picked up from my uh, ex-manager at Novartis was we have to treat our development system like livestock. They are generic, they are uh, disposable, right? They are not pets that we take good care of, right? Uh, they, they are uh, one-offs if they need to be. You can create and destroy those development machines at instance. And what this really implies then is you, you, we, we end up working on the cloud very often. Um, we might have, uh, and, and our environments are all basically ephemeral and we should be able to recreate them at will, just like that. Our CLI tooling helps with that as well, right? So um, some of the lessons I ended up learning was then we treat our development system like livestock. I need a cloud instance with a GPU, I spin it up. And then I don't need it, I turn, uh, shut it right down. My source code has to always get committed, otherwise I'm gonna lose any changes on my cloud instance. Um, we never treat our development system like a, a pet, right? Like I can close that instance, shut it down, and then recreate, uh, re-initialize a new instance just like that, like nobody's business. Your laptop, it's okay for it to be a pet. Like that's your laptop, right? Like that my laptop is a glorified Chromebook at this point because all of the heavy lifting and compute does uh, happens on the cloud. It also implies though that my laptop is no longer my development system. Uh, my development system is a cloud instance that is running remotely. So something that has really benefited this notion of portability is not working locally on my laptop, but instead working in an ephemeral environment. That is how we really uh, encourage portability and portability enables collaboration because now with the same set of idioms, I can get someone else, the same thing working on someone else's dev system, whether it is the cloud or their local machine, if they so choose to. All right. Uh, one thing that has been really cool, I mentioned this earlier, we've completely bought into Visual Studio Code. That's because, and it's actually Visual Studio Code with the remote extension. So I've always SSH'd in, through Visual Studio Code into my remote instance, into the project directory, and started development work there. Uh, as mentioned earlier, VS Code is great because there's the source code and Jupyter Notebooks in the same context with plugins for project management with Jira, Bitbucket, GitHub, your favorite ecosystem, all inside there as well. It's also multi-language. So if you end up not using the Python stack or Python plus Anaconda, but instead the R stack, that is also extremely well supported in VS Code. Okay, and because this is all like 100% remote cloud development, we end up with uh, a really awesome set of idioms uh, that enable us to work with one another. We can hop on a video call very quickly uh, and, and uh, do a screen share to uh, figure out whether code is, code is working or not, debug together live, we can do live share sessions that allow us to collaboratively write code together. Uh, if we need a larger instance, because this one doesn't have enough RAM or that one doesn't have enough GPUs available, we spin it up, recreate the environment and get going like within 10 minutes. So there's very, very little barrier for us to be able to uh, uh, swap between instances as needed and collaborate with others. 
Now, the final thing I want to talk about is also the thing that <laughs> always gets deprioritized. How many of you have written notebooks that uh, contain code and zero pros, zero comments? Like if you raised your hand, I have to raise my hand as well because I've done that as well. It is no shame in doing that. On the other hand, uh, if you are and if you are collaborating with other people, now that is where having notebooks that look like code and Python scripts alone is really bad. In addition to that, your lack of doc string, for example, uh, documentation would will end up creating barriers for other people to know how to use your code, right? So having great documentation is important for collaboration because it enables others to quickly gain the context that you have in your head about the project. In addition to that, others doesn't just mean some other person, but your future self. How many of you have had a project where you worked on something, abandoned the code for six months and came back to it and look, looked at it and good, like, went like, ah, I, I don't exactly know what I was doing back then. Uh, I don't like my code from six months ago. That is me sometimes as well. So your future self will also thank you for good documentation. It really helps you uh, enable, it really helps enable your ability to, to take on that, uh, that project again in the future. There's a phrase that I remember, documentation scales yourself. Documentation scales your ability to do things because you're not, if, if something is well documented, you won't get inundated with questions about that thing. You can, that thing will be well documented that other people can figure out what's going on. So your future self really will thank you in many ways if you write good documentation. To learn how to write good documentation, I'm not gonna harp on it over here because other people have written documentation about how to write good documentation. If you go to the diataxis, if you search for the diataxis framework, diataxis.fr, then you will see that documentation actually isn't one monolithic thing, but four kinds of things. And what this really, knowing this framework has actually helped bring a lot of clarity. We often say that when we write something, we need to know our audience. What the documentation framework diataxis does is it clarifies for us for these four types of documentation, who is the audience? Who will benefit? Who needs to know what? How much, and as a result, how much detail do you go into when you're writing the documentation? Okay, so to summarize everything that I've shared thus far, basically there are some mental models that I think need to be broadly, more broadly encouraged. As someone who has been hired and is do, has done hiring before, I have seen that uh, a lot of these mental models are actually very rarely present amongst the candidates that I have uh, have had the chance to interview. And so it's important, I think, to, well, at least one of my goals through this talk and other talks that I have done is to spread awareness about the need for these mental models. In the interest of collaborating, and in the interest of shipping, we really therefore need to be able to, one, standardize our practices and tooling, right? Make sure that we're working in established idioms in ways that are established idioms that, uh, that are shared amongst the people that we work with. The second thing is we really need to, in the interest of reproducibility, we want to be testing our code and making sure that our code from the past still works with notebooks that we have done in the past, for example, right? Uh, and that we never break other people's things inadvertently. So testing is really important. The third thing is how you, is the importance of documentation. As I mentioned earlier, if you write great documentation, not only will other people benefit, your work will also scale itself more naturally as well. And your future self will end up thanking you. The final thing is to start thinking in terms not of like, I just need to get my job done, but I want to get my job done in a way that also makes it easier for other people to get their job done. And part of that is defining single sources of truth for everything, right? You don't just copy and paste the data into a new directory willy nilly. You set up a system that says we have versions for our data. 
we have ver uh, we have sources of truth for our functions and we're always going to go and depend on those single sources of truth so if you think carefully about everything that i've said here they sound a ton like software practice software development practices and that is because they are software development practices there's nothing particularly uh, mystical about software development practices. They stem from these mindsets where you have standardization, testing, documentation, and single sources of truth for everything. And in doing so, you enable collaboration and easy shipping of your work. Software developers have actually tried to solve a lot of the problems that we data scientists end up encountering in our work. And they've been doing this for decades now. So if we're, and because our work ends up being written in Python code, R code, basically a programming language code, it behooves us to think more carefully about why we're not already adopting some of those practices, right? Um, and for those of you who are, who say, for example, like myself, have encountered the difficulties that, are encount uh, that you might uh, encounter, when you don't adhere to these practices, it will become really clear why these practices are so beneficial. Because they enable you to collaborate effectively and ship your work productively and really quickly. So that, I want to say thank you for your time. I'm going to leave some time explicitly to engage in a bit of discussion, q and I'm happy to address questions about this topic. Uh, if you do scroll on, there are more resources that you can look at. This is like just a sub subset of things that are uh, definitely out there and available that you can learn from. All right, so thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Eric. That was a really, really great talk. Uh, I, I think like not, I, I think all of us learn a lot. Uh, you, hey, you, you, you talk about several very unique uh, subjects. So uh, let me you tell you from the educators, uh, perspective. So in our program, like, you know, we teach, you know, uh, like a Python programming, we teach like machine learning stuff. But what you are telling us is like, we should also pay a lot of attention on uh, automation, right? Um, and right now, like, I know a couple of our instructors, they use Dockers, they, they teach how to use Dockers, but I feel like I think we should create like a, dedic like, like a dedicated course on all the things you like data science, project management and automation. Um, so, mm -hmm. but, but one of the things that actually, like, I also do lots of, um, uh, like computing, uh, uh, software development, uh, for like, uh, photonic ap applications. So, um, like in, in my past, I, I have received, I, I have experienced several pro problems. I found one of them was actually very funny. So in my first, uh, collaboration project, um, I had a, I, I was given a code, which all the documentation. But it was all in Serbian, so that documentation didn't help. Uh, it would, <laughs> yeah, it would be nice uh, if we can all use like English, right? Um, or a shared language at least. Oh, uh, exactly, exactly. So, um, like, I, my understanding is like our students should be really very comfortable with the object-oriented programming nature of Python, right? They should be able to write those uh, like uh, classes, functions, use like decorations, all all that stuff. But I, 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 so you know, in order to do this software development part of data science, I think they should be really um, on top of that. So you talk about like PyTest. Um, so my problem with not not my problem with my test, but my students, they try to do this test on the system level. So like we have this huge code. With so many sub functions, they change one sub function and then they, they do the test on the main output product. So, uh, mm -hmm. even though I'm trying so hard, I couldn't change their culture. Just test that function that you are replacing. If it's okay, yeah. continue with that. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, so uh, I perhaps do, be, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, some of the things that I mentioned come from a position of being having failed at that stuff before. Oh, you're um, so harsh pattern, to yourself. <laughs> that pattern actually of, uh, oh, I'll just tweak the function and rerun the entire pipeline to check the output. I've done that before. I did that for my thesis code. And for that reason, my thesis code feels very hacky, right? It does not feel like good software. And actually I, I left my thesis code on GitHub 
for all to see that I was once in that position as well. Um, so there's no shame, uh, though, if we have the desire, sorry, there's no shame in being in that position now, of course, but if we want to equip ourselves, I think, for the future, for a, a role that is exciting, that has uh, the capability to ship projects with that are impactful, um, then I think it's, it, 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 it is a really awesome thing to be able to learn about, you know, software testing, automation, and all of those other cool things that you, that you've, you've alluded to. Absolutely. And like, how do you handle this? Like, so, so, I understood the, the way you look at documentation, but I need help with the documentation in testing sites, because when I look at our testing folder, it just grows and grows and grows. And I don't know, like, which test is done for what? So how, how do you handle that? We, we, and uh, through the pre-commit hooks, every function must have a doc string. And because in PyTest, every test is a function, every test must have a doc string as well. And we take the chance to document the intent of the, of the test inside the doc string itself. Uh, what's also important is we engage in code review. And what code review exposes is any place that I, the code writer, or the documentation writer may have left implicit knowledge on the table and not written into the documentation. So when we do the code slash documentation review, it's important that the person re reviewing the code knows exactly what that function is supposed to do, how it's done, how it's working. It's how we back up each other as well and share knowledge. The person who did the code review is recorded in the Git history uh, through our pull request interface. And so we can ask if the person who originally wrote the code is no longer available for whatever reason, we can go into the Git history and ask who reviewed the code. We're going to ask that person. So that person is also on the hook and it is shared responsibility for the code. We never treat the code as my product. It is the team's product. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. So anyone from the audience uh, with a question or comment? I think Eugene has a question, and then there was oh. one uh, in the chat as well, which I think uh, we can address afterwards as well. Okay, so what is the question? Let me see, I, I cannot. Uh, Eugene, would you like to go? Uh, okay, sure. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. It was great, by the way. Um, and I also agree with Professor Simsek that uh, some of these things would be really nice to have in our classes. Uh, maybe not just have one class, but maybe start encouraging all of the professors to have some of these at least. Like uh, we have a lot of things like group projects, GitHub, um, and collaborations, which are kind of like optional. So the thing where you mentioned someone writes a program in file 12 and then changes it, someone else takes it and changes it in file 13, and now we don't know which one it is because it's the same name. This happens all the time. It's like we have Google Docs now, but some people only write in Microsoft Word and make their own version, and no one else knows. Um, like I'm trying to see like what is the simplest thing to take away from this. Um, I'm not an expert by any means at all, um, and I saw that you use VS Code, which my programmer friends highly suggested. So I started using that once I started data science. Um, yeah. You're using VS Code with Jupyter Notebook in the cloud with some extension. Can you talk a little bit more about this? And is this the easiest way you would recommend to do this? Because I feel like this is the one simplest thing that everyone in data science would probably instantly benefit from. But is it connected yeah, to like a server or something that, like, do you need to own a server to set this up? Because yeah, that just yeah, may complicate yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, here's, here's some of the ways that uh, I, or at least, at Moderna, here's how it works, and here's some of the ways that I've uh, done workarounds uh, to enable some of the similar kind of things in my own setup, my own personal projects. So at Moderna, we can spin up cloud instances at will, and I have basically a, 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 a an instance that serves as a workstation um, that has a GPU, has sufficient RAM, and I shut it down whenever I'm not like using it for extended periods which reminds me, I probably should go log in and like shut down that instance because I'm technically on vacation today. Um, so uh, the you in order to use VS Code with Jupyter Notebooks, you have to have the Python extension. And then in order to have 
VS Code run, generally speaking, on the cloud, you need the remote SSH extension. There's also an alternative called the remote containers extension. Uh, and that is what GitHub's code spaces runs on. You basically set up uh, what, what GitHub does is it provides, a, I believe, a, an 8 gig, 4 core system that you can use uh, that backs sort of like a container that, that, that serves as your development environment. It is very much akin to having SSHing into an instance and then running Jupyter Notebooks through the Python extension. Um, inside VS Code. So think about that in, in a, think about that along orthogonal axes. You have VS Code's Python extension to enable Jupyter Notebooks, and then you have the remote extension that enables you to re work remotely or versus locally. All right. So that that's like the easiest way to get set up with VS Code. Now, with respect to the practical aspects of um, practical aspects. That is, you know, assessing the quality of code, assessing the process by which things are, are encouraging good processes and stuff. Uh, these don't come overnight, right? So there's there's no so-called instant way of encouraging this. Um, I'm at, sure there's uh, no uh, PyLint extension that we can get from VS Code as well to fix this. Right. Um, to encourage good code review, that is a human practice, not a not not more than it is a code. Uh, code quality sort of thing. Uh, in, to enforce code quality, there are lots of tools that essentially get a bot to complain rather than a human to complain, right? So those are the things that reduce friction between teammates. You just listen to the bot. I just listen to the bot. I never override the bot unless it's a very, very special circumstance like we're dealing with legacy code that was not written by ourselves and we just need to depend on that thing by copying it over and, and deprecating an old repo, right? Like that, that is like the one case that we don't listen to the bot, but everything else, any new code that is written, we just listen to the bot for code quality. Um, to, to get the other practices into the curriculum though, that is going to take admittedly a lot of work. And I know for a fact that most, um, academic programs are not structurally incentivized to teach this stuff, right? They are, it is, it is structurally incentivized to teach the theory uh, more than the practice. Um, of course, there, every program has a little bit of a spectrum in between, right? So the data science program might be more closely aligned to the practical sides. Uh, sorry, data science programs might be more, generally speaking, aligned to the practical side. There's always going to be a bit of a gap. And that software development skill is actually teachable through external partnerships. There is one that I know of called Software Carpentry. If you have heard of this one, then that is an ex extremely excellent thing to encourage. Um, and I would actually encourage more, more than putting it in a formal curriculum, uh, I would encourage grassroots adoption of it. Or if you wanted to structurally incentivize the thing, allow students to create a course and teach a course that is the software carpentry course, right? And then if you did want to encourage um, better portability practices, make portability part of the grading criteria, right? Uh, set up automation where it says your final project has to be packaged in a Docker container and you get 10 points if you on your 10% of your final grade is did this thing run on someone else's computer, which are on the instructor's computer, right? Like that, something akin to that. Um, and then suddenly now there's a strong incentive to package up the thing um, in, a, in a sane fashion. So that, those, are, those are ways to encourage, I believe, those are my hypotheses at least, sorry, on how to encourage this. Clearly it's, it's not gonna work for everyone, right? Not every school is going to be equipped. Some schools are going to be better equipped for this. Some schools are going to be, some programs may have more institutional knowledge over these good software practices where others would be less equipped. So there, there's going to be customization needed, but I would, um, if you wanted to be able to structurally encourage this sort of uh, development of this kind of knowledge in, in, in the curriculum, then those are some of the ideas that I have. Um, 
I have a question from Rushab. So in this setup, your VS Code config would also need to be included in the files that are shared with fellows, right? I apologize. I just realized I forgot question mark. Okay. Um, the <laughs> no worries. Um, so your VS Code config files are actually three layers. You have user, workspace, and remote, right? So those are the three. Uh, those are the three areas. Uh, if you have user, if you can. If I forgot exactly which one takes precedence, but I believe user takes precedence over workspace, which takes precedence over sort of system, where, whether it's remote or local system. So if you want something configured but don't want it shared, you configure it in user. If you want a configuration shared amongst people, like we are all using Black for code formatter, then uh, you put that in the workspace configuration file and then ship that around to other people's VS Code. So that should be the way that. I think that's the way that this is handled. Uh, and then I have another question from Sharon, uh, which is how does data governance relate to the quality of data slash metadata? Is there a framework that we use? I'm going to admit I'm not 100% clear on how we do it at Moderna because it's still early days for us. But I do know that uh, we do make a distinction between so-called production data, that is the standardized um, at least in research space, the standardized data sets that are generated on a regular basis through high throughput experiments, those go into a standard like database of stuff that is well managed. The data versioning system that we use inside the data science and artificial intelligence team is intended more for the one off kind of data that may involve a few rounds of data collection, but no more than that. We just not, this is not like a standard assay, for example, that we run over and over and over. Uh, and so in that case, we, it is on us to maintain the quality of the data that we have, uh, that we, we agree with our collaborators on what constitutes good quality data. And then we set up automatic checks for them in our code um, uh, so that they're always guaranteed. Hopefully that answers your question, Sharon. Uh, I hear about these like you know, agile methods, Scrum method. Uh, what do you think about those methods? Like, or do you have any favorite of them? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, with respect to how we work, there is a recognition that data science projects can sometimes look like software projects and run like software projects, but at other times they are more exploratory and don't fit a sort of sprint time frame, et cetera. Uh, and so that is something that we're currently actively exploring at Moderna. Uh, we did engage our colleagues who run scrum sprints, et cetera, uh, to help us set up, uh, set up initial practices that we could try to work with. Um, so for example, we have a JIRA board that keeps track of all of our projects as epics inside there. Uh, some of those epics are very long running epics, right? Big major things that don't have a defined time frame, and we're explicit about that. And then some things are some epics are projects that have an expected end date, and we are explicit about that as well. So at, at the very minimum, we try not to be implicit about like, oh, is this thing going to end or is it not going to end? Right. We if something has this flavor of we need it, we need to keep track of this piece of work, but it doesn't have an end date, then at least we're very explicit about that. Um, I try to encourage my teammates to give as many constant updates to our collaborators as possible. Right. Like things that would make them bring them would spark joy in our collaborators. As soon as there's something like that, just share it. Don't don't like wait to package it up and polish it up even further, right? Just share it and share the update and show the update. Don't just tell, right? Show a work product that corresponds to that update. Even if it's not polished, it's fine, right? Like that's that's something that I try to encourage my teammates to do. It is a in their nature to sometimes want to be a bit more perfectionist, uh, sometimes for myself as well, when my my own work is at stake. So it is a constant battle against like perfectionist nature that we're engaging in. Uh, but definitely having the uh, an external person, someone else besides myself, going
going in and saying like, hey, hey, what's going on here, right? Like that um, someone else besides the code writer, sorry, or the lead lead person on a project to go to nudge the uh, updating of work to our colleagues is, is something that is, has been, has, has brought a lot of positive vibes uh, back to the team. And you, you all, I feel like you mostly use just Python, not R. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, part of the standardization was we standardized on Python, so we don't use the R stack, even though there are uh, packages that could be useful. We will make the time to, to uh, re-implement them if we need to. Uh, the reason here is that uh, managing a second language stack is harder than managing a little extra piece of code. So we have that trade-off in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we uh, standardized on was all our deep learning models are in PyTorch. And that's to for deep technical reasons, because we want to be able to eventually auto diff throughout all of our models or as many of our models as possible. So if we, I brought up the idea of could we use JAX, right? Uh, and then when we thought about the problem a little bit more deeply, if we had a mixture of JAX and PyTorch models in production, we, they would not be technically, from a technical standpoint, compatible with each other. Um, and so we would have a hard time of integrating those models into larger models if we so desired to do that later. So we standardize on PyTorch, uh, abandoning my preferences actually, which I'm totally fine with, right? Everyone gives and takes something when we do uh, the stand project standardization. Uh, and then after that, I brought in the idea that we should use standardize on PyTorch Lightning because there's so much boilerplate that you bo boilerplate code that you would write if you were to write pure PyTorch alone. And Lightning automates uh, takes away a lot of that boilerplate code, and we just adopted Lightning straight away, like no no questions asked. So that is uh, part of the standardization process that we ended up with. Not every team is going to standardize on Lightning. Some will standardize on Ignite, right? PyTorch Ignite, because Ignite is officially supported by the PyTorch team, whereas yeah. Lightning is not. Uh, we chose Lightning over Ignite just because of the compactness of the syntax. And that was the trade-off that we explicitly made in that decision. Uh, I, I see a hand up from Rushab again. Hello, Eric, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, first of all, it was very informative uh, talk. Uh, I learned a lot. I mean, I got to know about new, more new things. Uh, I actually do have three questions, if you can allow me to yeah. ask if you have time. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So uh, I'll start with the first one. Uh, the first thing which, like, you know, uh, attracted my uh, attention most was the data version control thing. Mm -hmm. So is it? Uh, somewhat related to the code version control like Git, so where we basically look at the differences between the code and then, you know, maintain the commit hashes, or yeah. is there, it, it has some other background for that? Um, what we have internally is a, at Moderna is a, is our own home, home rolled, hand rolled system. Uh, it is something that was developed by a very talented colleague, Max, plus our manager, Andrew, together, right? Like they had the vision early on before some other data version control tools became available in the open source world. So they really executed on it. And when I when I joined, I looked and I was like, okay, I'm using that thing because that thing's good. Um, so we end up using that guy. And the way that it basically works is if you, you, create, you create a new data set, you upload files onto that data set and it gets a commit hash associated with that. If you add files or remove files, uh, you need to commit, you need to create a new commit and you get a new commit hash associated with it. So it's very Git like, it operates on files, not on lines inside a file. So that's maybe a key difference over here. It's backed by cloud storage. So it's basically practically infinite storage. We, of course, try not to abuse the cloud, infinite cloud storage. But yeah, basically, it's very Git like. So hopefully that, that uh, answered your question, Rashad. Yes, uh, uh, so it's basically the file hash instead of the content hash. I mean, the different hash. Kind of. It's a. Uh, it's not only the file hash or content hash, but it's sort of like a unique identifier. You can you can call it, I guess, a a hash of everything that's present. If if uh, if you wanted to, I I think that's that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, so the next thing was that you you uh, you mentioned that. Uh, 
at Moderna, the and and your team, the deliverable deliverable is mostly either a Python package or a compute task. So, uh, uh, what would be a an example of a compute task be here? Yeah. So, compute task is basically our command line tool, packaged up inside a Docker container, and then configured in such a way that we can execute the command line tool from outside of the Docker container. So at its core, underneath the hood, there's nothing magical. It is actually merely Docker run, blah, 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 some container, and then the commands that are inside there, except we have a templating engine that lets us skin a website, web interface for us, that uh, allows not only us to run the Docker container locally on our machine, but also from the cloud itself, from on uh, on the web, um, and for us to be able to call because we have a Python API that calls on our compute tasks, we can actually um, we can actually programmatically launch uh, you know thousands of compute tasks at the same time and get let them all run on on the cloud. So it's a very, very well designed system. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to move over. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, the last thing would be you were mentioning about the highly scalable compute system uh, where your most of the work is being done. If you can uh, throw more light on that, please. Pardon me? If I could. Uh, uh, more light on that. I mean, if you could explain uh. more about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, underneath the hood, we had a software engineering team that supported the development of our compute system. Uh, to the best, I'm not 100% sure what the architecture is in the background, but I do believe it, it runs completely on AWS services. So the, the usual culprits, right? Because it's, it's container-based, probably Fargate or ECS. There's S3 and stuff inside there. The design, though, is like really amazing. Uh, if you're used to an, a high-performance compute cluster or AWS batch, then this lets you run stuff in batch mode. Like you can run long-running jobs in the cloud, and it will dump to uh, an easily accessible storage system, probably S3, I think. Um, but at the same time, it comes with an API that is both a web API, and because the web API is accessible by Python, there's a cli Python client as well. So this has a very strong fast API feel as well, because you can use web APIs to access the results of our jobs. So it feels like an HPC job slash AWS batch job, but it also has a fast API feel because everything is accessible by an API. Uh, all the results are accessible by an API and launching jobs is done doable by an API as well. And it also has like an AWS Lambda feel or, you know, Azure Functions feel where you're basically deploying like a single thing into the cloud. Like, so you're deploying one task at a time. You never deploy really like highly flexible programs. It's kind of an anti-pattern, uh, only done in a few really important instances. Um, and so it really has this very cool trifecta feel. It's like a mix match. Uh, it's a mix match of like, fast API, uh, AWS batch, and AWS Lambda all rolled into one. And it, it, it feels like the right design choice, especially for life sciences, where you have not real time short running functions, but actually long running functions that need to need time to process and finish. So you do need like that batching kind of feature, right? So that's probably a little bit of a, the architecture behind the scenes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It, it 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 sounds really interesting, and now actually I'm more excited to see it and how it works. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, for answering my question. And yeah, again, my it, it was a really good talk. My pleasure. Are there any other questions uh, that y'all are curious about? Alrighty, it looks like maybe not. So if so, then happy to happy to end it here. Um, if you all have other questions, I think uh, Ergun, uh, Professor Sinsek, or uh, uh, the other faculty should have our should have my contact information. Happy to get in touch with y'all. Thank you so much, Eric, for for the talk. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks everyone for, for attending. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.